As you all know, our tradition is filled with storytelling. It's an intricate part and an integral part of our religion and our heritage. And there are many ways to tell a story. One of the most effective ways is to tell it from the heart. And here to do just that is Joey Barron. Before I start this, I need to do two things. One, I need to apologize. Maji begged me to keep this to 10 minutes, and I can't. So, you'll have to indulge me. The other thing I want to say, which occurred to me um, yesterday, I think, when one of the run-throughs I was doing in the privacy of my office, um, is this story, well, I've got to backtrack. I've always wanted to do this. I, ever since I saw Spalding Gray, I thought the idea of somebody just getting up and telling this story was the coolest thing in the world. And I always wanted to do this. And I realized that this, you would not suffer through this if it went for three people. So you can blame them. Without the rabbi, without Glenn, and without Maji, this story, in fact, would not be possible. So. It's hard to tell where some stories begin. This one, for instance. Does it begin at 6.30 in the morning, which is an ungodly hour to me, even if I am in Jerusalem. But I'm too excited to sleep. And when I open my eyes, there's one of my oldest and dearest friends in the same room. And no, I'm not dreaming. <coughs> or does it begin when I'm 16 years old, and Bud and I meet at a BBYO convention? It's just like we discussed last night at midnight while sipping coffees on Amek Rephaim. Here we are in Israel together, seeing Jewish youth groups, and all because we met through a Jewish youth group. And now, 36 years later, we're both hoping to help some kids develop a friendship that will last them a lifetime, and that they can save a one midnight in Jerusalem. But Bud sleeping, and that was last night. Does it begin in Texas with a woman who rescues to fill in? Or does it begin in Filene's basement? As most of you know, this past July, I was blessed to join the Follow Me to Israel mission to learn more about Team Summer programs. But in accepting the mission's official mission, I soon assumed three others. The first mission begins in Texas. A few years ago, as I started going to Minyan more regularly, my ever thoughtful and ever bargain savvy wife, Debbie, gave me a rescued set of tefillin. Here they are. Though I don't put them on very often, I really like having them. As soon as they showed up in Boston, it was obvious that these tefillin had been very well loved. Though in their current condition, they're probably not quite kosher, but they're more than kosher enough for me. Whenever I take them out, I can't help but wonder whose they were. I imagine them to be short and stocky, like one of my old Hebrew school teachers in Mattapan. A loving guy, a tough guy, but probably a guy whose clothes didn't smell so fresh. <laughs> Maybe he was a camp survivor who put them on every day to make sure God saw the numbers on his arm. Maybe he had no children. No, no, maybe his children married non-Jews and he disowned them. Whatever the reason, somehow the rescue lady found the tefillin, Debbie found the rescue lady, and best of all, I found Debbie. As soon as I registered for the Israel mission, it became my mission to bring these tefillin same to fill in, to the Kotel, my second mission. This came from my best friend David and his wife, Nami. Now, David and I met many years ago when we were both house mothers at the University of New Hampshire and were chaperoning a trip to Quebec. I was the only other person on the bus who knew the lyrics to Expressway to Your Heart and who knew that it was done by the soul survivors. From that first trying to get to you, for a long time, 
Our friendship has been one long running gig. Over the years, David became part of my family, going to my folks for Shabbos and all the Jewish holidays, whether I was there or not. My parents became his parents, since his had both died before we met. Somewhere along the way, David falls in love with a rabbi's daughter. And as David's self-appointed Jewish brother, I try to assure one and all that as stubborn as he can be, David will convert, and that we would be and are a better people for it. Many years later, in the summer of 2005, David and Naomi go to Israel. David, who speaks no Hebrew in his inimitable way, befriends Yossi, an elderly falafel maker in the Ben Yehuda Shuk, who speaks no English. <laughs> Maybe Yossi knew who the sole survivors were, too. When I tell him I'm going to Israel, David asks me to have one of Yossi's falafels and tell him that David and Nahama from Boston say hello. A falafel mission, I can do that. But the person I really want to meet is the guy who approached David at the wall one day and asked him if he wanted to daunt to Philip. Now, David, in many ways, is like my mom. As Hamish as he is, if you want him to go to temple, you've got to invite him. <laughs> Weddings, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, baby, naming, baby namings, invite him, he's there. But without an invitation, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Though I don't think he ever dons to fill in, David is the ultimate when in Rome kind of guy. And as the guy is walking him over to the tefillin table, he asks, are you Jewish? Sure I am. A couple more steps. And your mother is Jewish. <laughs> and when David says no, the guy walks away. My David, arguably the most righteous person I know, and you have the nerve to think he's not Jewish enough for you, you are to fill in a Shonda. That's the guy I want to meet. <laughs> but that's not the mission David gives me. My mission is to say hi to Yossi, the falafel man. So one afternoon, a group of us head over to the Shuk for lunch. David and Naomi have given me explicit directions on how to find Yossi and the best falafel in Jerusalem. Incredibly explicit directions. Explicit, but wrong. <laughs> they tell me his is the first falafel stand on the right at the first alley from the street. Only there's no falafel guy there. Just a shawarma guy with some mighty fine-looking shawarma, too. <laughs> the others can't resist. But, but I can't give in. I'm a man on a mission. And I'm not alone. My new friend Harold from Framingham decides to be my six-foot-three Sancho Paza on our falafel quest. After an hour searching through countless food stands, we decide to eat at the next place we see. There he is, an old man with white hair, a white beard, and a gray leather keeper. It's Yossi, who still speaks no English. I convey the message to him, and when he realizes who David from Boston is, his face, light, his face lights up, like most people do who know David. And he charges me only eight shekels for my sandwich. Harold doesn't know David, he paid ten. <laughs> but the falafel mission is accomplished. Now back to the fulfillment. That mission was accomplished days before. I brought them to the hotel on the first morning. I hope they enjoyed it. It was my first time that being at the hotel wasn't an amazing experience. 